tomorrow. John Edwards joins us live right here in the Situation Room. We'll see you then. Let's go to Paula in New York. Paula. Well, thanks so much. Good evening, everybody. Glad to have you with us tonight. An explosion of violence all across one of the most dangerous parts of the world. Are we on the verge of a mini catastrophe? Talk about a mother's courage. This mom has four sons in the army, and pretty soon they will all be in Iraq. How could that be allowed? Plus, a missing woman, a desperate search, and a very disturbing question. Would the media pay more attention if she were white? Tonight, the Middle East is in flames. Everywhere we look, there is deeply disturbing news on Israel's border civil war. Gunmen from the Hamas faction of the Palestinians shot their way into control of Gaza, declaring Islamic rule and blowing up government buildings. The president of the Palestinian Authority counters by declaring a state of emergency. He's backed by the U.S. Hamas is supported by Iran and committed to the destruction of Israel. In Lebanon, meanwhile, a day of grief and fury as the victims of a political assassination are laid to rest. Many Lebanese blame Syria for the killings and aren't buying the Syrian denials. And as always, there is bloody Iraq. In reprisals for yesterday's bombing of a Shiite shrine, at least nine Sunni mosques were attacked today. The whole country is locked down tonight, bracing for even more violence. Let's turn to Hala Garani, who joins us tonight from Baghdad. So what is the government of Iraq doing tonight, along with U.S. forces, to try to stop this violence, Hala? You mentioned the current and complete lockdown. 36 hours ago, a curfew was imposed on Baghdad and other major urban centers. It's a vehicular and a pedestrian curfew as well. Also, that bombing of the Samara Mosque, the one that sparked 16 months of bloody sectarian carnage in this country. Well, security forces are heading there trying to prevent reprisal attacks uh, as well. But and no matter what you do in a country like Iraq, uh, Pala, violence continues today. Uh, Several rockets hit inside the green zone, the international zone, one of the best guarded places in Baghdad. But despite the curfew, these are things that still continue to happen. Paula? So what else can the government uh, of Mr. al Maliki do about this if the curfew doesn't hold and doesn't help? Well, uh well, that is a good question. The government of uh, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki is a weak, it's a fractious government. What they're trying to do right now is keep the curfew in place. It's open-ended. Uh, but when you really look at it, there is not much they can do. The curfew eventually is going to have to be lifted. And that is the big question. Once the curfew is lifted and once people are free to move about and cars are free to drive around major cities, especially Baghdad, where there are mixed neighborhoods, the fear, of course, is that these reprisals attacks and we've seen some throughout the capital but the fact that the curfew is still in place means it's impossible at this point to count the number of attacks and really count the number of bodies that are found bullet riddled across the capital on a daily basis and how I understand there's a great concern with Friday prayers about to ready to get underway that, that there is an increased fear of even more of these reprisal attacks what exactly is expected well, that is the case indeed, uh, Paula. When you have uh, mass gatherings of human beings going to Friday prayers, despite the fact that there's a curfew, you really can't control. Uh, people go to pray uh, and pray on Fridays in this country as well as through the Muslim world. So everybody's going to be on guard. Essentially, uh, it's fair to say the country is holding its breath. Everyone remembers what happened after the first Samara attack. This time, the two golden minarets of the al Askaria Mosque have gone down. What is left of that that mosque is literally, the top part at least, a pile of rubble. So in the next 24 hours, we're going to be able to assess just what the impact of this latest bombing is going to be for the country and also for all these strategies that the U.S. is putting in place. We're talking about the surge. We're talking about a Baghdad security plan. This can supersede all of that uh, because it is such a symbolic target. Hala Garani, thanks so much for the update. Appreciate it. Now, many people who watch our coverage of the war do it with a very personal connection. They have children over there. It's got to be really difficult, especially for parents with more than one son or daughter in combat. So get ready now for the extraordinary story of one mom from Missouri. She's about to see a big group from her big family go to war. Keith Oppenheim has their story tonight. We're here looking for a private James Ryan. He's part of your outfit. Any chance at all you policed him up? 
The movie Saving Private Ryan is the fictitious story of a World War II Army unit that spends weeks tracking down one soldier, all because his mother had already lost three sons to the war. This is the real-life story of Joyce Stahlschmidt. In a sense, she's the commander of her own military unit, the mother of 11 children. Four of them are in the Army, and in just months, they will all be going to war. Reality smacks you straight in the face, and it's like, I know this is coming, I knew it was coming, but here it is, this is the day. Her oldest, 27-year-old Joshua, is preparing to leave Fort Dix, New Jersey, and go to Iraq in July. This is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to go for. Peter, Joyce's second, in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, was shipping out. It was just something we all chose to do individually. Not to be outdone, 22-year-old Samuel... Incoming! ...doing drills in the California desert, set to head to Iraq for his second deployment. I kind of have an idea that anything my brothers can do, I can do better. And Daniel, age 20, is already there at Camp Ramadi. I've always wanted to do it since I was nine, to join in the Army. So it was a dream come true for me. Because of the military life, it's been three years since all four boys have been together. But ironically, by year's end, the Stahlschmidt brothers very well could meet, because by then, they'll all be serving in Iraq. People probably think the chances of one of your sons either getting seriously hurt or losing his life is high. Exactly. I see it everywhere I go. It's like the odds are you're going to deal with tragedy, absolutely. Joyce is a proud mom who tries hard to contain her apprehension. She says her faith gives her faith her sons will pull through. I believe in God. I believe it's more than just a stray bullet or what might happen. Um, so I refuse to even give place to the idea of odds. It turns out the military doesn't calculate odds much either. Consider that during World War II, the five Sullivan brothers from Iowa all died when their ship was torpedoed and sank. After the Sullivan brothers were killed, there were several bills introduced to Congress related to family members serving together. None became law, in part, military officials told us, because it's tough to track who's related to whom in the armed forces. Bottom line, legally, there's nothing stopping the modern-day Stahlschmidt brothers from going to war together. The two oldest Stahlschmidt sons say they chose the army on their own. Then the younger ones followed. The boys downplay the danger for mom. She knows that it's not about, you know, going over there and something bad's going to happen automatically. But they know how tough it must be for her. My mom is pretty much freaking out right now. <laughs> Now that all four of us will be gone, she's trying to help, but she can't. She's losing control really much. Are you balanced throughout all this, or is it uh, some days just are really hard? I would like to say yes, I'm balanced, but I got to tell you, a week ago, I was wondering if I was sane. Her laughter perhaps covers a deep fear that one day she'll get bad news. There was a time or two that somebody came knocking on the door and. My, my heart flipped because the thought that it might have might be somebody from this from the service from the service uh, but it wasn't but it wasn't no but that's the kind of tension that's in the background yeah and that Ooh, is that Gail? yeah to keep joy steady and to keep track of the Stahlschmidt brigade her sister donna coordinates family communication with the boys through the internet and lots of text messaging. The Stahlschmitts are not really a traditional military family. The parents did not serve. But their joke is, being in a family with 11 kids is the best preparation. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like an army. Everybody waits in line for meals. Joyce doesn't tend to take sides about this war. For her, it's not about politics, it's personal. It's my choice that they all feel fulfilled and doing what they believe that they should be doing, so. This is what a parent goes through. It's what a parent does. A mom, you, you let your kids go. You, when they become adults, you let them go, and that's love.
But as she lets them go, this mother of 11 says she will pray that her four sons return home from Iraq safely. Keith Oppenheim, CNN, St. Louis. What a family. One more thing. It'll be at least two more years before the whole family can get back together again. But two commanding officers have said they will try to arrange a meeting of all four brothers in a safe place in Iraq. Another story we're following tonight concerns a hospital where some people say the care can be downright dangerous, in some cases even deadly. In just a minute, we're going to hear from somebody else who went to that same hospital. Just wait till you find out what happened to him. And then a little bit later on, a Miami holiday turns into a troubling mystery. Why has this young woman vanished? And why aren't more people paying attention? Plus, a court case exposes a very scary threat. Our would-be terrorists growing up all around us right here in our own country. Paula's on now, brought to you by Volvo. Experience the full line of 2007 Volvos. Who would you give a Volvo to? Volvo for life. For a limited time, we're offering zero down, zero first payment, and zero security deposit. That's right, zero cash due on delivery on the Volvo XC90, one of the world's most award-winning luxury SUVs. Sign your name and drive away. It's that easy. Our sign and drive sales event is the perfect time to go to a Volvo retailer. We know you'll hear the answers you want. Lease a 2007 Volvo XC90 all-wheel drive for $459 a month for 24 months. Zero due at signing. My dad says if you make a promise, you should always keep it. So how come we can't fix Social Security? What about pensions? We keep those promises. And don't even get me started about health care. If we don't do something about health care soon, we're all going to look pretty silly. I think we can do better. A lot better. Don't you? Join AARP in championing your future and the future of every generation. For ways you can help, visit AARP.org. The 12 hour sale is this Saturday. Open at 9. They normally open at 10. It goes till 9 p.m. at night from 9 to 9. This Saturday, you're going to save money as soon as you walk in that door. You get 30 to 50 percent off the already wonderful, awesome price. And I've got my eye on something already for Father's Day there. He would love that. One thing for me, something for him, three things for me. Some reasonable. You leave there with a whole bunch of stuff and still have money in your pocket. Steinmark, once you go, you get it. I wish they had it for 12 days instead of 12 hours. Here's a radically simple suggestion from Elon. If your adjustable mortgage rate keeps rising, maybe it's time to call Elon at 1 800 Try Elon or go to Elon.com for a fixed rate mortgage with one low monthly payment. Elon, radically simple. He's there with all the love in his heart. Fell so madly in love. It was love at first sight. You know, she tells me she loves me more and more every day. He loves me. I love him for exactly who he is. I mean, that's what love is. Love is wonderful. eHarmony.com. So, say you're watching Pirates of the Caribbean. Hmm, did somebody say calamari? The closest would be... Ah. sleep it needs a better way to sleep at the touch of a button sleep number beds adjust firmness to relieve pressure points giving you more deep sleep you can cure tired take control visit a select comfort store or call 1-800 sleep number as if high school isn't tough enough for some kids imagine being named Osama Meet a boy with that name and find out what he has to put up with every single day of the week. Out in the open now, we're learning of more shocking failures at a troubled hospital in Los Angeles. We told you last night about an outrageous case of a woman who was basically ignored until after she died. She was vomiting blood in the emergency room and getting no help at all. The people with her even called 911, hoping to get her to another hospital. 
Tonight, Ted Rollins talks to another patient from that same hospital who may have been lucky to get out alive. In the emergency room, my wife is, uh, is dying. The nurses don't want to help her out. As Edith Rodriguez was dying on the emergency room floor of Martin Luther King Jr. Harbor Hospital, 911 dispatchers received two separate calls. Both callers seemed to see what hospital staff members apparently didn't, that this woman needed immediate attention. Okay, what do you mean she's dying? What's wrong with her? She's vomiting blood. What happened to Edith Rodriguez is an extreme example of more than a decade of troubling incidents at a hospital that serves some of L.A.'s poorest residents, many of whom are uninsured. Just four months ago, Juan Ponce was diagnosed with a brain tumor by the King Emergency Room staff, but then, apparently, they completely forgot about him. Instead of transferring Ponce to another hospital for immediate surgery, he says he was left to sit for four days in the King Emergency Room. They don't give me food, nothing, for three or four days, never ask me for medicine for the pain. Nothing, nothing. Ponce says eventually his condition became so bad he couldn't see or speak. Finally, a family member got the staff to move him. I've seen a lot of people that wait 14 or 15 hours. This man who doesn't want to be identified works in the hospital emergency room. He says he wasn't there when Edith Rodriguez died, but says he can see how it could happen. If you're working there, how could, how could that have happened? Incompetency is the number one issue. Not all days this way, not every day is this way, but most of the time there are problems to treat the patients, I would say, and to take care of them, yeah. In a response to both cases, the director of L.A. County's health services said in a letter this week that because of what happened to Juan Ponce, the hospital's chief medical officer was put on paid leave. As for the Rodriguez case, the letter says the triage nurse in charge that night has resigned, and all employees working in the triage area that night have been counseled and written findings placed in their personnel files. I think everybody uh, has some answering to do for what happened at this hospital that night. Uh, the chief nurse, uh, the physician's assistants who may or may not have known what was going on, uh, other personnel, uh, the people who were sitting in the waiting room who didn't lift a finger to help her and watch the whole thing happen for 45 minutes. Ted Rollins, CNN, Los Angeles. And there's another thing to add tonight. The chief medical officer at King Harbor says despite the two recent cases under investigation, he says he believes a hospital, as you just heard, is getting much better. And uh, he really does believe it might be able to stay open. As we speak, a young woman is missing and urgent search is underway. And we're about to take you along. There are pockets of wild areas. And those are areas that if someone were to get into the middle of, you, no one might find anything in there for, for months. Coming up next, a baffling mystery that raises more disturbing questions than you might think. Plus, the terrorism plot against Fort Dick. Some of the suspects grew up here. What could turn people like them into potential homegrown terrorists? Tonight on 360, the seemingly perfect family. Three members murdered in a peaceful town where they don't even lock the doors at night. The question now, why? And did they have a deadly secret? Anderson Cooper 360, CNN Tonight, 10 Eastern. He's dead. 27 years I worked with him. Building up the business from nothing. He never took a sick day in his life. Then bang, a heart attack. And now I have a new partner and a 51% shareholder. His 24-year-old kid. I think I'm about to have a heart attack. Throw out your notions of what you can talk about with a financial advisor. Come to Smith Barney, where wealth works. Folks, left to your right, a spectacular view of the Grand Canyon. Say goodbye to obstructed views. The virtually invisible true scene insect screen from Henderson. Go online for a free sample. <clears throat> Say goodbye to obstructed views. The virtually invisible true scene insect screen from Henderson. Go online for a free sample. 
Did your teachers ever make fun of your name? Well, this boy's teacher did, and it sparked some legal fireworks. Stay with us for Osama's story. If you've ever thought about leaving your job behind and starting your own business, the man you're about to meet ought to be an inspiration. Betty Nguyen has tonight's Life After Work. Love. This is the aptly named bakery born out of owner Warren Brown's fervor for cake. Uh, making cakes from scratch is something that I started after I began practicing law. The health care litigator was disenchanted with his day job, so he started thinking about his future. I don't want to have a midlife crisis that I can predict. I know that I don't want to continue practicing law for the rest of my life. And I know that I love food. I didn't grow up like making cookies and cakes with my mom, so Baking for me was something that was very uh, new, and I had a fear of flour. I put myself through the warm brown culinary school. <laughs> I just marched through different recipes, experimenting and trying. The thing that made me say to myself, okay, you've got to get out of this law by day and baking by night, was that I physically ran out of gas. I had to go to the emergency room. The doctor said, listen, you've got to slow down. So Brown turned his full attention to making a career out of cake. A year and a half after Brown quit practicing law, his first cake love store opened. There are now three in the Washington area, but it's not the only outlet for his passion. I've got a show called Sugar Rush on Food Network. Here's a guy who's on a quest to learn more about baking. For me, it's a total dream. When I'm baking, I'm happy. And I didn't have that practicing law. And with cake, I finally got to this place where I've always wanted to be. Betty Wing, CNN. I'm hungry. We're going to switch gears now to an urgent search tonight. A young woman went to a Miami nightclub and simply vanished. Stay with us. You're about to ride along on that desperate search. Life After Work is sponsored by the personal advisors of Ameriprise Financial. Get to what's next. Log on to CNN.com slash Life After Work for more on Life After Work. Dreams are powerful. Just because we're retiring doesn't mean our dreams have to. That's why Ameriprise Financial created the Dream Book. Before we talk about numbers, we want to know your dreams. Call 1-800-509-4799 now for your free Dream Book. Then let an Ameriprise Financial Advisor work with you, one-to-one, -one, face to face to develop a financial plan to help get you there. Because the best book on retirement is the one you'll write. Larry King tonight, Angelina Jolie on Fame, Family, and her new film, A Mighty Heart. Larry King Live, tonight, 9 Eastern, only on CNN. Metal detecting is one of America's fastest growing outdoor activities. I saw the metal detector ad on TV, and I've always wanted one. So I called. Detectors are so easy to use now. The whole family gets into it. Call for your free metal detecting catalog from White's Electronics. With a White, all you do is turn on and go. You know, my dad had one, but it wasn't like this. The screen shows you what's in the ground before you dig it up. There's never been a better time to start detecting, so call for your free catalog today. And just for calling, we'll include White's Detecting Adventure Kit absolutely free. It gets me off the couch. Keeps me in shape. Gets us outdoors. The Detecting Adventure DVD explains the fundamentals of metal detecting and features interviews with expert treasure hunters talking about their most exciting finds. You'll also get 25 best kept secrets to finding treasure filled with important lessons to help you find more. I found a really old coin my first day out. Alex finds more than I do. You wouldn't believe what we found in our own backyard. Call for your metal detecting catalog and your free detecting adventure kit now. American Morning, the most news in the morning, period. Tomorrow, 6 Eastern. And we're back tonight. An urgent search continues in Florida for a young woman who has been missing since Memorial Day weekend. She had just graduated from college and was in Fort Lauderdale visiting relatives when she vanished. You may wonder why you haven't heard her story while stories of other missing young women get blanket news coverage. We'll talk about that in a moment. First, though, Susan Candiotti gives us an inside look at that search tonight. At a homemade shrine on a dining room table. I look to the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help will come from the Lord. Sylvia and Steve Henry are praying police will find their daughter alive. 22-year-old Stefa is still missing after vanishing nearly three weeks ago. I think she's been held against her will. That's what I think it is. Why do you think that, Mr. Henry? Because 
Stefa would never go off on her own like that. Never. The honors grad from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, who worked as an alum in the president's office, was in Florida with her teenage sister for Memorial Day weekend. Police say Henry left her aunt's apartment very late at night, told her she was going to a nightclub. Her aunt saw her niece get into a car with a family acquaintance. And that's the last time she saw her. Stefa Henry did go to a nightclub's private party. Luckily, the owners were shooting a promotional video, and here's Henry in a freeze frame released by police. But what about the friend who took her there? He said that he, he left the club early, that when he left the club, she was still there and with some other people that, that he did not know. Police say he also told them he drove Henry to the club that night in a borrowed late model Acura Integra, and police can't find it either. Investigators will not release her friend's name and say he is not a suspect. Police are flying over more than 2,000 canals and wetlands where vehicles are often dumped looking for the mystery car. We flew with them and they spotted something from the air. See that white beneath the water? But it turned out to be the wrong car. There are pockets of wild areas. And those are areas that if someone were to get into the middle of, you, no one might find anything in there for, for months. Not when Henry's frantic parents want to hear. They've been calling their daughter's cell phone. All they hear is this. Sorry, that voice mailbox is full. Please call again later. Police suspect Henry last used her phone to check her voicemail around the time the club closed. Stefa, we love you and everyone else loves you and they would love to see you home. Henry was planning on law school next year and loves legal mysteries. He will protect you as you come and go, now and forever, amen. Now her parents pray she's not part of a real life crime drama. Susan Candiotti, CNN, Miami. We did a Google News search and turned up only 48 stories about Stepha Henry. Compare that to the 4,000 we found on Kelsey Smith. The 18-year-old white woman from Kansas was kidnapped from a Target parking lot and killed two weeks ago. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage for the white woman. Barely a word about the African-American. Why the huge difference in news coverage? Let's bring that out in the open with tonight's panel. Political strategist Cherry Jacobus, Mark Smith, constitutional attorney and commentator. And BET correspondent and producer Jeff Johnson, who's also a political strategist. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jeff, uh, I want us to look at these numbers together again. 100 times as many stories on Kelsey Smith than Stepha Henry. Is that because Stepha's black? Well, I, 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 it would be nice to say that it doesn't matter, but I think that there is an underlying issue here which seems to be what is the value we're placing on women of color. Um, so I would say yes. I would say that we just don't see those stories. And the only explanation in my mind is that there's less of a value placed on those women of color than these beautiful, quote unquote, young white women. Uh, you Mark, know, I see you shaking no, your head and you're no. pretty angry when you heard what Jeff just had well, to say. It's not a, I don't think it's a question of being angry. I think it's just looking at the facts. We have to keep in mind, look at the Duke rape case where you had a black crime victim, or at least an allegedly black, black crime victim, and that got a year's worth of play. What makes crime <laughs> stories stories and sensationalized is there has to be a wrinkle. And whether it's, and, and the old saying in tabloid news business is the best stories are murders, at sort of fancy addresses. And whether it's Brentwood, California, which is the O.J. Simpson case, sure. or you know, in Rhode Island with the you know, Klaus von Bülow killing his wife story, the point is, it's something has to be something unusual about it. And in this instance, this case we're talking about, it's not that unusual, unfortunately, for college-age kids to have problems in Florida after you know, being out till two in the morning at a nightclub, in contrast to the Kansas case with Kelsey Smith, where you're looking at a teenager abducted in a target